Philippians chapter 2, page 980 in the hardcover Bibles. And uh, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray before we go into the sermon. Father, we are grateful for this word of yours that reveals to us the dignity, the majesty, the divinity of your son, Jesus. We ask, Lord, now that as we think about what this means for us as we approach Christmas, that, Father, you would humble our hearts to receive what the teaching of Scripture is on this matter. That, Lord, you would unite our hearts to those of all believers in every generation to worship Christ our Lord as King, as God, as Messiah, and as Savior. Lord, we pray that in worshiping him, we would trust him. And in trusting with him, you would do what you have promised to count us righteous, to consider all of our sins taken care of and all of our uh, obedience to the law fulfilled through Jesus because of faith, rather by faith in your son. For we ask this in his name. Amen. I have to confess to you that I am a little sleep deprived. Um, uh, babies will do that to you and uh, so I, am, I, I, I have written down what I wanted to say this morning but I'm not sure it's going to come out quite the way I intended to say it so uh, bear with me if I stumble and uh, may the Lord uh, help us to learn from his word together the alternate title for my sermon uh, this morning, actually this Advent s- sermon series is something like How the Grinch Almost Stole Christmas, um, which I thought was cute. Uh, but it's important to think about this, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But as we enter this Advent season, what could cause Christmas to go wrong? What could happen to the Christian teachings about Christmas that could actually ruin the whole thing? You know, when you bake, say, peanut butter cookies, there are certain ingredients that if they're missing, they're no longer peanut butter cookies. Now, one time Heather was making peanut butter cookies, and our our family came around to enjoy the finished product. We thought, these are wonderful cookies. What are they? They said, they're peanut butter cookies. And we all said, no, they're not. We don't know what they are, but they're not peanut butter cookies. They're delicious, but they're not peanut butter. Heather had forgotten the peanut butter. So without peanut butter, whatever those cookies are, they're definitely not peanut butter cookies, right? So what is it in Christmas? What are the ingredients, the teachings, the doctrinal commitments, the, the beliefs that make Christmas Christmas, without which it's no longer Christmas? What parts of the New Testament story of Christmas can we live without? If we took away the choir of angels, and we took away maybe the worship of the shepherds of the baby, or the magi from the east, the wise men, whether there were three or however many there were, or if we took away the the virgin birth, would it still be Christmas? As you know, Christmas is primarily the celebration of the greatest miracle in history. Far and away, when God became man, when God became incarnate, bodified, bodily, when he took on flesh, this is the greatest miracle in history. It's the greatest miracle to which the Bible attests. And I find it then a little odd that many people who sing about the wise men, who sing about the manger, who sing about the star, who hang on to those parts of the story, more and more commonly don't believe that Christ is God. 
They don't believe in the incarnation. They don't believe in this greatest miracle that makes Christmas Christmas. When God became flesh. The scripture is so clear. Really, how do we interpret the scripture is the question that, gets, that, that we keep coming back to as we think about what is Christmas about? Who is Jesus? What we have to wrestle with is what the scripture teaches on this matter. And not just one passage here or one passage there, but all that the scripture teaches on this matter. So the conclusion that we reach from scripture is that Jesus is God in his very nature. Look with me again at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus is God in his very nature. Think about what this verse claims. Verse 6 says this. Talking about Christ Jesus, who, though he was, notice the past tense, though he was previously, or at one time, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Think about what this is saying. Verse 6 is saying, before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he existed as God. It says, though he was in the form of God, and now we look at that word was, and it's definitely past tense. And we look at that word in the form of God, and you might say, what does that mean? Does that, could that possibly mean that Jesus looked like God? Could it mean that he resembled God? What do we mean by form? And of course, the Greek word here uh, is the same word that we get metamorphosis from. It's the word morph. He was in the morphe of God, which is saying that uh, there is a morphe that belongs to humanity, and there's a morphe that belongs to God. There's a very natural essence. The nature, the attributes of humans are called the morphe of humans. The nature, the attributes of God are called the morphe of God. It's not saying Jesus looked like God. It's saying in his nature, Jesus was. Was God. He was at a previous point in the nature of God. And then it says something else. It says he was equal to God, but willing to give up something. Our text says uh, that in verse 6, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. For him, he did not consider, one translation says, that it was necessary to hang on to equality with God. That word grasped, again, we might say, well, what does that mean there? Is it possible that this means that Jesus uh, had, the, had the chance to reach out? Like, you know, when you're on that, what do you call those with the horses? Uh, merry-go-round. When you're on a merry-go-round, see, my brain is not fully functional this morning. When you're on a merry-go-round and there's that brass ring, is it saying that there's a brass ring called equality with God that Jesus thought about grasping, about reaching for? No, it's not saying that at all. It's quite different. It's saying that Jesus was previously in the form of God, and then at that time, he did not think it necessary to hang on to, to grasp, to keep hold of equality with God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean then Jesus, in his incarnation, when he became a man, is no longer God? The answer is no. The answer is no. It's saying that Jesus did not consider that he had to hang on to the very high position and the glory of God, of being God. And the next verse tells us what he did, what it meant that he did not consider hanging on to equality with God, something that was necessary. The very next verse says, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, the form of one of us, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, so critical to realize what this scripture is teaching us about the nature of Jesus Christ. This scripture is teaching us that in his nature, Jesus is God. But that in his great, profound humility, he did not think it was necessary to retain the high position and status and glory of God. 
so that he could come and become one of us to rescue us, to save us, to substitute himself for our sins, and to redeem for himself us as a people to follow him to glory. There's a wonderful thing here, so that Jesus Christ's humility is breathtaking. If, if I was given the office of prime minister, I would have a hard time letting it go. I can understand why some men, when they get into an important office with a lot of status and prestige, why they fight for re-election. I can understand that because I would do the same thing, I think, in their shoes. You want to hang on to power. You want to hang on to glory. Isn't it human nature? Tell me, isn't it, isn't it our nature to hang on to the way that people admire us? If there's something that we think people admire about us, isn't it our human nature to try to keep that going? Isn't it, doesn't it seem like it's so against human nature to humble ourselves and let someone else shine instead? Especially if it costs us the admiration of others. See, this is one way, it just is, it's amazing to me. The nature of God was such that in his humility, he didn't think it was something necessary to do, to hang on to his glory, to hang on to his status, to hang on to his high position. He conceived of a plan to rescue us through humbling himself and giving all that glory up. He did not give up being God. He gave up all the trappings and the, the sort of the, the fame and the prestige and the honor that goes with being God. He gave it up to become a baby that needed a mom to change his diaper. He gave it up to become a baby born and sleeping among animals in a barn. He gave it up to become a carpenter. Now, today, carpenters like John, we admire them. But there was a time when carpenters were among the lowest of the trades. He gave it up to become more than a carpenter. He gave it up to become a savior who died the death of a, a common, not an, actually a common criminal, a rather exceptional criminal. He went to death row on a Roman cross. <laughs> So Romans, in their culture, they could not even talk about crucifixion. They could not, not even look at a, crucif uh, a cross or a crucified person. They, it was something to be shunned because of its great shame and horror. This is what God did to rescue us, to save us. So in the humility of cross, we find our salvation. In the humility of Jesus Christ, we find our salvation. But in his nature, as we look to see who does the scripture say he is, we find it unanimously attested that Jesus Christ is God. The Son of God. The Son of Man become a human. And the Lord of glory. So the divinity of Christ has been at the very core of Christian teaching. It is what makes Christmas Christmas from the very beginning. But it has also been the single most attacked doctrine of the Christian faith. I want you to understand that in this church at Beacon Communities, we are all about worshiping Jesus because he is God. If he is God, so just think about this, whether you believe this yet or not, think about this. If he is God, if it's true, doesn't he deserve our worship? In fact, don't we owe our worship to him? That we would admire him? That we would find our meaning in him? That we would love him or learn to love him? That we would praise him? Acknowledge him? Instead of turning our backs on him? Being embarrassed by him? Denying him? And disobeying him? This is all if it's true that he is God. Wouldn't you agree with all of that? This is the Christmas confession of faith, that Jesus Christ is God. And we believe that, so we worship him. We, we know that God the Son humbled himself and took the form of a servant. We see this as a miracle that we celebrate at Christmas. And this conviction from the Bible has always been the primary mark of what true Christianity is. There are all kinds of groups that call themselves Christian that have already abandoned that claim that Jesus is God. But historic, 
true Christianity has always hung on to that mark because it's the earliest thing that we believed as Christians. It was preserved in the original old version of the Apostles' Creed. And I would like to read that together. Maybe you want to join me in confessing this. This is from the oldest form of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, This is what we believe as Christians. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, who sits at the right hand of God the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, the life everlasting. That is what we believe. That is the Christmas doctrine buried into that ancient confession of our our beliefs. But along the way in history, there were four challenges to who Christ is that almost stole Christmas. So that's why I called this alternatively the Grinch who almost stole Christmas. There were actually four of them, or maybe he tried four times. Uh, This is our theme over the next three weeks. The theological attacks on, first, the divinity of Jesus, that he is God. Second, the humanity of Christ, that he is also human. And thirdly, that will be week three, the week before Christmas, we're going to look at how those two natures exist in one person. The distinction between his humanity and divinity, and the unity between his humanity and divinity. So you remember the Grinch. How does Dr. Zeus describe him? Dr. Zeus, uh, Theodore Geisel, I think is how you pronounce his name, wrote about the Grinch who stole Christmas in 1957. Do you know what led him to write that story? It was Boxing Day, probably the year before, so probably 1956. The day after Christmas, you understand. And he was looking in a mirror and what he saw was a grumpy face. And he realized he'd been grumpy throughout Christmas. And he'd spoiled the celebration of Christmas. And he he realized, I am the Grinch. And he came up with this story to illustrate that he wanted himself on Boxing Day, he wanted to begin to recapture something of what Christmas means. He wanted to recapture something that he'd obviously lost about Christmas. In this week's sermon in particular, but also in the next two weeks, I want to recapture the wonder, something of what we may have lost about the doctrine of Christmas, the teaching of Christian Christmas. I want to talk about the Bible says so clearly that Jesus is God, and what would be lost if we didn't believe that? I want to talk about what the Bible teaches next week, that Jesus is human, and what that means to us, and how important that is. And the third week, how we can think about it, how we should talk about how we do, how we describe that Jesus is, in Christ, he is both God and human, and how we mix those things, those two truths together. See, Christians in history have often been persecuted by non-Christians. Oops. Let's stay there. But through all Christian history, the people who call themselves Christians have been trying to change what we believe about Christ, about his nature. There's been Christians in name who have consistently, in every generation, fought against the biblical teaching that Christ is God tried to change what the church believes about that. So false teaching about Christ is therefore called anti-Christian because false teaching about who Christ is is literally anti-Christ. It's against who Christ is. Looking back through history, it seems that the devil's strategy uh, to undermine the gospel, to, to bring the church to nothing, was first to try and kill off the Christians. And then when that didn't work to use bad theology in the church to deny who Christ is. So the Christians could remain, but we'll just steal their God from them. And then when that didn't work, at the beginning of what we call the Dark Ages, the devil's strategy seems to have been to challenge the authority of God's word, the scriptures. And by and large, that strategy, I believe, has stolen the salvation message from millions. There are millions of people who have called themselves Christians in name, but have not hung on to what the earliest form of Christian doctrine was that we just confessed in the Apostles' Creed. 
There have been millions who have believed that something uh, of the Bible is true, but have denied certain key parts of the gospel story that actually make, make it so that we lose our salvation message in Christ. We're going to cover some of that story in our 2017 series on the prophet Daniel. So you can come back then and we'll look at how that story has unfolded. But as soon as the gospel began to spread in the first century, Christians began to suffer persecution from the government, from the Roman government. First locally in towns and cities where the gospel was not welcome. And then more generally, more widely under the emperors. So the emperors like Nero and Domitian and Trajan, Around the year 303, the last and worst Roman persecution of Christians broke out under Diocletian. And in one 30-day period, as many as 17,000 Christians were killed. What was interesting about that persecution was that almost all of those were killed from among the army, military, the soldiers. People who worked for the army or worked for the government were among those who were persecuted and killed because they would not recant Jesus Christ. But the real threat, the real Grinch that almost stole Christmas was not the physical attack on the lives of Christians. The real Grinch that almost stole Christmas was from people who found it hard to understand and therefore accept what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is, that he is God. They wanted to make Christ less, like, less supernatural. So persecutions under Roman emperors were attacks on Christians. Teachings that undermined who Christ is were attacks on Christianity itself. And I think millions have lost their souls because of anti-Christ teachings. But then we come to a story in church history that I wanted to share with you. The reluctant pastor who saved Christmas. Now that's a bit, I'm exaggerating a little. Uh, he was reluctant and he was a pastor, but I'm exaggerating. He didn't quite save Christmas single-handedly, but he did save it for millions, I believe. See, if Jesus is not God, we have no salvation message. This becomes very clear, and it became very clear to many Christian pastors and thinkers in the early centuries of the church. And many churches that called themselves Christians were beginning to um, profess what is called Arianism. A, a teaching led by an uh, Egyptian pastor named Arius, who taught that Christ was not eternal. That he was not in nature God but that he was the first and the highest of all God's creatures, like the, the foremost of creation, but he was still part of creation, not above creation in the form of God. And you know what? His teaching is not hard to understand. His teaching has this going for it that anybody could get it. And it fit really well with Greek philosophy. You know, one of the things about our culture is we hear about the virgin birth, we hear about the incarnation, and we presume something about that because of our cultural values and beliefs, right? We presume, we all do, miracles just don't normally happen. In fact, we might presume more solidly than that that miracles can't happen. Isn't that right? We're scientific, right? Stuff like that just doesn't happen, right? And this is our cultural presumption. The Greeks had a different cultural presumption. Their cultural presumption was that what is holy cannot be earthly and material. If it's earthly and material, it's stained and corrupt. If it's God-like, if it's divine, it's got to be somehow above the earth, a better, pure, spiritual. If something spiritual became physical, it's no longer pure. It's no longer holy and sacred. It's contaminated. So Arius had something going for him is that everybody thought, hey, that makes a lot of sense that Jesus wasn't actually God because he had a body. He only was the highest of God's creatures. That made sense to the culture. So it caught on and churches all over the place began to teach this. To the point where about 50 years after Arius began to teach his doctrine that Christ was not God, uh, and this was after the, the decree of Constantine, so the Christians were now relatively free to practice their faith, Arianism looked like it was about ready to actually drown out true Christianity. It was about ready to take over everything. 
And it was about, like, drown is actually a good word because Matthew Henry and a number of Bible commentators thought that this flood of heresy, this flood of Arianism and some of the other false doctrines was what is symbolized in Revelation 12, 15, where John saw a vision of a dragon with a river rushing out of the dragon's mouth that was about to sweep away the church. So they thought that this is a period in time in history symbolized by that where it was the teachings of Arianism that were about to drown out the gospel all over the world. And at that time, in the city of, or a young man from modern day Turkey, Natsianzas, I have no idea where that is today, a young man named Gregory was elected to be an elder in his hometown. And unlike Glenn, Unlike Glenn, Gregory totally did not want to be an elder. He was very reluctant. He, it, was, it was not what he had in mind for his life. And so what did he do? Like any good man who becomes appointed or elected to become an elder who doesn't want to do it, he ran away to become a monk. So he ran away and shirked his responsibility that he didn't want in the first place. In time, he kind of returned back to his hometown and he began to serve as a pastor. But then he ran off a second time, uh, and understandably, when he was really hit hard by the deaths of his mother and father and his closest loved ones, uh, all died in a fairly short period of time, and it devastated him. So he uh, ran off again to to, uh, contemplate. In time, he returned again, but he was devastated by the news that his mentor had died, Basil. And Basil's life work had been to combat, to fight against Arianism. So Gregory, at the news of hearing that Basil had died, Gregory decided to pick up Basil's life's work and fight against Arianism by teaching the true Christian message, teaching the scriptures clearly and in detail that Jesus is God. So what did he do? He was in a small town in northern Turkey. He decided to move to become a church planter to the capital city of the whole empire, Constantinople. And not only that, he was going to plant a church in Constantinople that was unlike every other church in the whole city because every other church in Constantinople was Arian. They were teaching that Christ was not God. And Gregory had it in mind to plant a church that would declare the truth. Of course, they had no place to rent, no place to gather, so they gathered in the home of one of his relatives. And every week, for years, they suffered vandalism. They suffered things being thrown at them as they would go to church. These other so-called Christians that were Aryan Christians would persecute them relentlessly for about 10 years. But this little church, this little church that could, it did. And it held on, and it endured this persecution. And it declared that Jesus Christ is God. Until about the year 380, a new emperor came on the scene, a man named Theodosius, who happened to be an Orthodox, Trinitarian, a Trinity-believing Christian. He came to the throne in Constantinople. And when he got to know about uh, um, Gregory, I was going to say Glenn, when he got to know about Gregory... (laughs) Uh, Theodosius decided to appoint Gregory as the bishop of Constantinople, of the head over all the churches. So you get this overthrow that's happening. It's a real coup d'etat that Theodosius wanted to make Gregory the head of all the churches in Constantinople. Suddenly, just like that, Gregory didn't even want to be an elder in his hometown. And he finds himself made the bishop of Constantinople. Well, what he did was he took Theodosius' lead and together they called a church conference, a council, with gathering all the bishops from all over the place. And Gregory presided over this and uh, where they reinforced the doctrine of Nicaea, the, the creed of Nicaea that affirmed the Trinity from the Bible. So Jesus is God the Son. He is God himself and part of the triune Godhead that we know. So right away he resigned and went back to his hometown where he died in relative peace and quiet without being out of the spotlight. That was what he wanted in the first place. I share that story because it matters in history. Constantinople was the capital of the empire at the time. Constantinople affected the entire trajectory of Christian teaching for the next several hundred years. What was at stake when Gregory planted that little, tiny, home-gathering church, Christ-worshipping congregation in that capital city? What was at stake? Was it really a matter of life and death? Lots of verses affirm that Jesus is God. We can give you a long list of them. 
But in what way does salvation depend on Jesus actually being God? In what way does our salvation hang on that? That Jesus is divine in his nature, that he is God, as the NIV says of Philippians 2.6. See, if Jesus isn't God, then the gospel isn't true. If Jesus isn't God, the gospel can't be true. C.S. Lewis said, There is no halfway house, and there is no parallel in other religions. If you had gone to Buddha and asked him, and C.S. Lewis is very clever and very, he understands a lot of things about world religions, and so he builds this into his humor here. I hope you appreciate it. He says, if you had gone to Buddha and asked him, are you the son of Brahma? He would have said, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion. He says, if you had gone to Socrates and asked, are you Zeus? He would have laughed at you. He said, if you had gone to Muhammad and asked, are you Allah? He would have rent his clothes and then cut your head off. If you had asked Confucius, are you heaven? I think he would have probably replied, remarks which are not in accordance with nature are in bad taste. But when doubting Thomas confessed to Jesus, my Lord and my God, Jesus did not rebuke or contradict him. Rather, Jesus blessed Thomas. The scripture and our gospel hope depends on the idea that Jesus is God. What does Jesus claim? Jesus claims to be able to forgive sin. And his enemies got the point. Now, if you're interested in this, I simplified my sermon because it was very complicated. And I realized this is all in this book. So you can look, grab this book in, from the church library, uh, Christian, Christianity for Skeptics. It's not Christianity for Dummies. It's Christianity for Skeptics. And so you can pick this up from our church library if you're interested. But these points are just wonderfully simple. Jesus claimed to forgive sin, and his enemies understood that. So in Matthew 9, 1, 8, they are reacting with anger that he is claiming to forgive sins. And they say, only God can forgive sins. If Jesus is not God, he cannot forgive our sins. Jesus claimed in John 5, 25 and 29 to be able to judge the world. Who else can judge the world but God? Jesus claimed in John three sixteen to be able to give eternal life. Jesus claimed in John 8, 46 to be sinless. Unlike every other human being in world history, he claimed to have no sin. Jesus claimed in John 8, 24 to be the object of faith, that people should believe in him. Not believe about him, but to believe, to trust in him, to depend on him for everything. Moreover, a Jew in first century Judea Jesus claimed to be able to answer prayer in John 11, for, uh, sorry, 14, 13. Jesus claimed to be worthy of worship in Matthew 14, 33. Jesus claimed to be the truth, not just to know the truth, not just to teach the truth, but to be the truth in John 14, verse 6. Matthew 28, 18 and this one's remarkable. Jesus claimed to have authority. How much authority? In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus claims to have all authority. All authority in heaven and in earth. Jesus claims to have that authority. And in John 10, 30, Jesus claims to be one in essence with God. If Jesus isn't God, the gospel is no tr not true. There is no way to reconcile humanity to God and God to humanity. We needed a divine mediator, a divine priest, a God priest to stand between human sinners and a holy God and put a hand on us both and reconcile us. No one else could do that but the man who is God, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, Therefore, there is one man, sorry, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if he's not God, he can't be our Savior. Because the Old Testament says in Isaiah 43.11, I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. 
Jesus is not God, we can't know God. We don't know God. As Jesus said to, to Philip, he said, Have I been with you so long, and still you don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? In John 14, 9. And Colossians 2, 9 says, For in him the whole fullness of the deity, the fullness of God, was pleased to dwell. And John 1, 14 and 18 puts it very bluntly and says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then it says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side he has made him known. My friends, if Jesus is not God, then we shouldn't trust any of what he said. Because as C.S. Lewis famously argued, Jesus must therefore, if he wasn't God like he claimed to be, he must therefore be either a liar or a lunatic. And yet God vindicated Jesus. Everything Jesus said about himself, everything Jesus did, God vindicated that and honored that when when God raised him from the dead, proving that what Jesus said was true. That when he said he is God, he was telling the truth. So Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh and vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Moreover, if that doesn't quite nail it, if Jesus is not God, then God cannot be love. Everybody in the world likes the idea that God is love. But if Jesus is not God, God cannot be love. Jesus made his teaching, sorry, I skipped a part there. John 4, 1 John 4, 8 and 9 says, God is love. And then it goes on, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. This is how God showed his love among us. John says that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. You see, if Jesus is not God, then God is not God. If Jesus is not God, there is no trinity. And if there is no trinity, God cannot be love because there was nobody nobody to love before God created the world. How can God be love in his very nature before creation if there is no one but God, singular, a single person? The Christian doctrine of the Trinity shows us that God was always love and there was always someone to love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Without that triune relationship, there is no eternal nature of God that is love. So, It seems that it's important for the sake of our belief in the gospel. It seems that it's important for our salvation, even to know who God is as a God of love, that Jesus is God. But if Jesus isn't God, then we should not even worship him. If he isn't God, he's a liar, as C.S. Lewis said. He made his teaching equal with the authority of, of the Old Testament scripture. How many times did Jesus say, you have heard that it was said, he's talking about the Bible, you've heard that it was written, but I say to you, so he's making his teaching equal with scripture all through Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the one who said, heaven and earth will one day pass away, but my word will never pass away. Jesus said that. Three times in John, John shows that Jesus made himself equal with God, and the Jewish leaders understood that and decided to kill him for it. Three times in John, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And what did his hearers do? They picked up stones again to stone him, John says in John 10, because they said, you being a man are making yourself equal to God. Jesus called God his own father and said that he was uniquely doing the work of the father. And John writes, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's why the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. And in John 8, 58, 
One of my favorite verses in the entire scripture. Jesus calls himself by the personal name of God, I am. And when he does that, claiming to be the I am that revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 3 before Moses went to Egypt to rescue the the Israelites. When he said, I am, the Jews in the temple picked up stones to throw at him because they could not accept that someone they were sure was just a man could call himself God. If Jesus isn't God, he's a liar when he does all that. And therefore, we should never worship him. If Jesus was not God, we are guilty ourselves of the sin of blasphemy when we worship him. The apostles, those founders of our faith, the the fathers of our faith, sent out personally by Jesus, the apostles did not let people worship them. In Acts 10, 26, and even better, in Acts 14, 15, when the people of that town thought that the two of the apostles were gods from heaven, Zeus and Apollos, I think it was, uh, and they found out that the people were about to have a celebration in honor of these gods who'd come to earth, the apostles tore their clothes and ran out in the crowd shouting, No! We're just like you! Don't worship us! That was the apostles. But even in Revelation 19, an angel, a high and powerful angel from heaven, did not let himself be worshipped. This angel says to John, John writes in Revelation 19, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. In Revelation 19, verse 10. But Jesus accepted the worship that belongs to God alone. So in Matthew 14, 33, it says, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. In Matthew 2, verse 11, it says, Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. This is the wise men, the magi. They fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. In Matthew 28, verse 9, it says, Behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. This is after his resurrection. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And in Matthew 28, 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then it says in Luke 24, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And then the blind man in John 9, 38, the blind man that Jesus had healed, he came and said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. All this is throughout the Gospels. All this is throughout our scriptures. And then there's that dear doubting Thomas. The man who was filled with doubt. Could this possibly be true? And when he saw Jesus again after Jesus had been raised from the dead, and Jesus told him to touch the scars in my side and in my hands and my feet, see if it isn't me, Thomas. John writes that Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus, John continues, says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It matters so much that we believe Jesus is God. Without it, we lose everything. With it, we have eternal life in his name.